Let's go over the highest attack of all the normal monsters. For level 1, we have Volcanic Rat with 500 attack. Technically tied with Shadow Spectre, however, it has a higher total defense point value as well, so we'll be counting that in order to resolve ties. For level 2, we have Digitron with 1500 attack, which defeated a long held record by Lantian Pikeman, which prior to 2017 was the highest at 1400. Level 3, we have Jerry Beans Man's at 1750 attack, holding the highest attack record all the way since 2005. And at level 4, we have a 10-way tie at 2,000 attack, with only two of them having a defense point value at all, and only 100, putting Alexandrite Dragon and Gene Warped Warwolf tied for first place. At level 5, we have Cybertech Alligator with 2,500 attack. Level 6, we have Lightbringer Lucifer at 2,600 attack and 1,800 defense, beating out Frostosaurus by only 100 defense points. At level 7, we have Metaphist Armed Dragon at 2,800 attack. And at level 8, we have the Blue-Eyes White Dragon at 3,000 attack, holding the record for the highest attack normal monster since the game's inception. And there are still no normal monsters with more than 3,000 attack in the game. The Power 9 is a term in MTG for the 9 best cards from the earliest set that can't be power crept. But does Yu-Gi-Oh really have an equivalent? If we look for the 9 best generic cards that are good in the most amount of decks and comes from the earliest sets, we tentatively have a list that looks like this. However, if we update have more modern cards, we have to talk about these 7 cards as well. All of these cards are ridiculously powerful, but don't really qualify as being part of the earliest sense. If you look at the draw cards from the early days, we have these four cards here, but only two of them can really be used in any deck. However, if you look at the three hand rip cards, all three of these are really powerful and require almost no setup to use. If you look at the powerful consistency cards for decks, we have these two cards, which would immediately see play in pretty much every deck if they were unbanned. But we also have singular powerful cards that can summon a lot of monsters, like these three cards, or four cards if we had Soul Charge, but that was added in 2014. And then we have old school floodgates like these two cards, but we missed not to add Mystic Mind to that list. So if we add up all the cards I just talked about, that's 14 cards from the early set, and additional 8 cards are released in more modern times, which were equally some of the most powerful cards ever made. And this isn't even an extensive list, just a cream of the crop. There's an old school staple card called Wabaku, which has the effect to protect all your monsters from being destroyed by battle for a turn, as well as preventing you from taking any battle damage. However, you wouldn't have known that back in the day based on how the card effect is worded. Because in the very first iteration of the card, its effect was that any damage inflicted by opponent's monster is decreased to zero during the turn this card is activated. Nowhere in its text does it say the monster is also not destroyed by battle. And the reason this card was able to protect your monsters was because they ruled the card to work that way, because that's how they intended it to work. You see, in Magic the Gathering, which a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh is based off of, if a creature in that game has its attack lowered to zero and attacks into another monster, nothing happens to that monster because creatures in the game also have health point values, and are not destroyed until the health point value reaches zero. So in that game, if you wanted an effect like Wabaku, you could just word the card exactly like it was worded in the first iteration of Wabaku in Yu-Gi-Oh. But in Yu-Gi-Oh, battle damage doesn't work that way, like, at all. And Wabaku didn't get an update to its card tax until its second erratum, which finally explained what the card was actually supposed to do. Lightning Storm is a normal spell card with the effect, where if you control no face-up cards, you can choose one of its two effects to either destroy all attack vision monsters your opponent controls, or destroy all spell and trap cards your opponent controls. And Lightning Storm is a very heavily played staple. But why is it that people prefer to play Lightning Storm over cards like Harpy's Feather Duster or Raigeki, two cards which have slightly better effects than Lightning Storm? Well, because of the modal nature of the card and being able to destroy your opponent's back row spells and traps. You see, you need back row removal, if not in your main deck, then in your side deck, so you don't instantly lose to Floodgates. However, not everybody plays Floodgates, so if you played something like Harpy's Feather Duster or Twin Twisters, it would just be a dead card against a lot of decks, whereas Lightning Storm is always usable, as long as you're going second and you have no face-up cards on your side of the field. Even though you can technically always use Harpy's Feather Duster in any position since it has no restrictions on its activation requirement, it's still better to play Lightning Storm because it has the option to also destroy monsters which is worth the restrictions. Because that versatility just matters a lot more when every singular card in your deck has to do everything and then some. What are the top three strongest cards of 2022? Well, if we ignore full engines, we have to exclude all the tier limits, sprites, and the Shizu cards and go into more of the good one-off cards. So at number three, we have Garuro. A fusion monster requires any two monsters the same type and attribute as materials, as long as they have different names. This card is the ultimate super polymerization target while doubling as an excellent punishment and ultimate slayer target because it has a good graveyard effect too for some reason to draw a card. At number two, we have Kashtira Fenrir, a card which somehow managed to power create Panger Tops, a feat no one really thought was possible. It's a going second option that could spell some stuff from your hand, search another copy of itself, and then banish a card your opponent tries to interact with it or if it declares an attack. At number one, we have Bistial Magma Hut, a power crab DD Crow, which can give you a big body on field, graveyard disruption, and a plus one during the end phase of any dragon monster from your deck or graveyard. Even with the Ashizu cards making graveyard interaction almost impossible, people still play this card in their deck at three copies. Honorable mentions to Mathmex Circular for codifying how to fix an old archetype with one card, and Morphtronic Telephon for being actually just a broken card that should be banned. What are the best field spell cards of all time? At number 10, we have Zombie World. This is a floodgate that changes all monsters in the field and graveyard into zombies and prevents tributes of not zombie monsters. Great for stopping decks like Tri Brigade, Dragon Link, and Flu. 
At number 9, we have Domain of the True Monarchs, which can lock your opponent out of the extra deck entirely like a permanent scythe. Trickstar Light Sage at number 8 can let you go plus 2 on use, gets 2 bodies in the field for Verte plays, and pops 1 back row for free every turn. Spiral Resort gives your Spiral Cards protection for most hand traps, in addition to being a free plus 1 every turn. Orchestrated Babble lets your graveyard cards dodge targeted graveyard hate hand traps, gives disruption thanks to Dingursu, and recovers itself if it gets destroyed. Dragonic Diagram lets you destroy cards in hand to trigger effects, and searched out very good cards in the past. Necker Valley shuts down most graveyard-centric decks, which there are a lot of in the modern meta. Primeval Planet Pearl Reno provides a surge, pop, and attack boost that all combos very well with a tier 0 archetype. Runic Fountain soft once per turn that draws 3 cards and turns all your runic cards into hand traps and goes plus 6 by turn 3. And Mystic Mind can win you the game all on its own. So, what are the highest defense normal monsters? For level 1, we have Charcoal and Pachi with 2100. For level 2, we have a 4-way tie with cards that have 2100 defense and 0 attack. Technically meaning that level 1 Charcoal and Pachi has more stats than the level 2 lineup of defense monsters. An interesting note about the level 2 monsters bracket is that one of them is a Pendulum monster, where normally Pendulum normal monsters have attacks on their stats because of the benefits of being a Pendulum monster, except when it comes to defense points as you'll see for level 3. And also one of them is a Tuner, which normally should have attacks on stats as well. For level 3, we have Dragoons of Draconia at 2100 defense. Level 4, we have Battle Footballer with 2100 defense and 1000 attack. Technically tied with 4 of the monsters with 2100 defense, but it has the highest attack points out of all of them. For level 5, we have a tie between Millennium Shield and Labyrinth Wall with 3000 defense, being the absolute max when it comes to defense point values for normal monsters. For level 6, we have Neo Aquamador at 3000 defense. At level 7, we have Hiro Zanru at 2800 defense. And finally, at level 8, we have Dragon Core Hexer, which is a normal tuner monster with 3000 defense. And there are no normal monsters above level 8. Ultimate Slayer is a spell speed foregoing second removal option, which is really good at getting rid of extract boss monsters, but requires you to send the same type of monster from extract to the graveyard in order to use it. Here are some of the best targets you can use for the various types of extract monsters. For fusions, the best target is obviously to Tiss to pop a second card when it's sent to the graveyard, with Knight, Wagon, and Garuru being secondary targets. For Synchros, the best is Pegasus, since it can spin a card when propped from the graveyard, secondary best targets being Omega. For Xyz, Aggregator is the best target since it has a negate, with Toad being an option if you play water monsters, or one of the two ghost trick monsters if you have a ghost trick engine. For League monsters, the best target is Trouble Sunny, but you do have to play a brick in your main deck if you want to be able to use Sunny's graveyard effect. A secondary target with the Paleozoic Link monster as it protects your back row with its graveyard effect, or for Jit, for a mulligan. Let's add the total stats of the attack and defense points of all the normal monsters for each level, and see which ones have the highest totals. At level 1, we have Oppressed People with 402,000. It's one of the 5 level 1 monsters that has 2,000 more defense, and it has the highest attack point value out of all of them. At level 2, we have Bytron with 202,000. Less total stats than level 1, and only 100 more stats than the 4 level 2s tying for second place. At level 3, we have Giant Soldier of Stone with 1300, 2000, easily beating out every other monster in this level, with none of them even coming close. At level 4, we have Calf Keys the Magic Key Sky Blaster with 1919, only having 300 more points total than the second place in Pachi. At level 5, we have Cybertech Alligator with 2516, winning this spot while having the highest attack of its level as well. At level 6, we have Lightbringer Lucifer at 2618, also winning its spot by having the highest attack in its level bracket as well. At level 7, we have Wing Weaver with 2750, 2400. This is the second highest attack level 7 monster, and used to be the highest attack level 7 until Metaphys was randomly released in 2014. And final level 8, we have Rabbi Dragon with 2950, 2900, beating out number 2 by only 100 points. A Towers is a Yu-Gi-Oh term in order to describe a monster which is unaffected by card effects and very hard to take out. The term is named after Apocalyphor Towers, which is one of the first immune boss monsters that was so incredibly difficult to defeat that it was actually banned for a number of years, since it had the effect where monsters a level or rank less than it could not affect it, as well as being immune to spells and traps, having 3000 attack baseline, lowering the attack of all spell summon monsters by 500, and once per turn being able to send one of your opponent's cards to the graveyard. Towers, however, is easily defeated by any link monster with removal, so it has kind of fallen to power creep. But even so, if there's a really good boss monster that's hard to defeat, they'll generally refer to them as a Towers-like card. Royal Tribute is a spell card which has the effect where if you control the Necro Valley Field spell, both players have to send all monsters in their hands to the graveyard. Now, we have cards like Forceful Sentry and Confiscation Banned because they're spell cards that let you get rid of one card from your opponent's hand, which is generally used to get rid of hand traps. And Necro Valley is a heavily played side deck option in a lot of decks. So, why does no one play Royal Tribute too? Well, despite the fact that the card is actually very strong, and was limited on the ban list for many years, the big reason why this card doesn't see play is because it's not searchable, and you can't reliably get Necro Valley on the field anyway. Not even its own archetype can search out Royal Tribute, and since it requires the field spell out to be usable, it's a two card combo that's generally not worth playing, because it's just not very consistent since it's a dead card in hand without the field spell. So you're much better off just playing all the other power card staples instead, or just more mainline engine pieces. 
Castell is a rank 4 monster of genetic materials who can detach both of its materials to shuffle any face-up card in the field back into the deck. This effect was so powerful and so readily available to pretty much every deck that it kind of revolutionized boss monster protection, where if a monster could not survive a simple Castell, then it wasn't good enough as a towers. However, nowadays Castell is barely on anyone's radar as an option, even in the side deck. So why did such a powerful and heavily played staple completely leave the meta? Well, simple power creep. Nightmare Unicorn basically does what Castell did, but better. Unicorn can be summoned with any 2 plus monsters, as long as they have different names, which makes it available to every deck instead of only decks that runs level 4 monsters. Additionally, there were a ton of powerful going second cards to release, where if you're inherently relying on a going second effect like Castell, chances are your deck is going to be able to answer whatever your opponent has better, or you can just go into Unicorn, if it can't, with anything you manage to actually put on the field. Gores is a hand trap that can special summon itself from your hand when you take damage while you have no cards, and then you get a token if it was battle damage, or you just inflict it back if it was effect damage. And in early Yu-Gi-Oh, this card was such a powerhouse and plate staple that it changed how people attacked with their cards. So, why does no one play this card anymore? Well, because in modern Yu-Gi-Oh, the ability to stall the battle phase is just not important. Additionally, boss monsters are a lot stronger than they used to be and are a lot easier to bring out. So even if it was able to come out during the battle phase, chances are your opponent would be able to destroy it with little problem. Additionally, if you're in a position where your opponent is attacking your empty board, chances are one of their cards will have a negate and be able to stop the effect from happening in the first place. And in best case scenario, if you do happen to bring out Gores and keep its token, you don't really advance the game state better than just playing any other staple going second card, like a Pangratops, who's a much better big beat stick that can also destroy stuff and has a much easier summoning condition that's more controllable. Basically, the power creep of the game has gone to the point where they're just better cards that can have big mods in the field quicker, and a battle phase only mechanics are generally not very valuable, especially when they can be negated so easily. 